Eric Amaral is expected to retire at the end of the 2023 NASCAR season, and Zane Smith could join Stuart Racing in 2023. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got some NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into those really, really quickly. We're going to have I start talking about sponsorship, as a couple of Xfinity Series races have had their sponsors announced for 2023. First, the Michigan Xfinity Series race is going to be called the Cabo Wabo 250. And for Watkins Glen, it's going to be called the Shriners Children 200 at the Glen. Really good to see that their sponsorships have already been announced. I believe the Shriners Children has sponsored the Watkins Glen race in the past or other Xfinity Series races in the past as well. Nonetheless, really great to see that the sponsor for those races has already been announced. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Abercrombie and Finch. As it was announced on Wednesday evening, the Abercrombie and Finch has become a new licensee for the first time in NASCAR history. Now, Abercrombie and Finch do have a working relationship with McLaren in Formula One, also think in IndyCar as well. But it's really cool to see Abercrombie and that being said, it's been many years since a lot of us have seen that company. But it's interesting to see that Abercrombie and Finch have joined NASCAR. Very interesting stuff. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Worldwide Technology and the Portland Purse Money. As every single week we have a NASCAR Cup Series, Finney Series, or Truck Series race, Bob Poggers shows how much purse money the race could make. And according to him, for the Cup race at Gateway, it's $7,425,976. For the Xfinity Series race, it's $1,376,231. And for the Truck Series, it's $738,514. Not as much purse money as for last week, the Coke 600, when all three series, of course, were in Charles. So, of course, you had a lot more teams showing up. And also, more money was being made. But that is the purse money for this weekend. On worldwide technology and at Portland as well. So that's the purse money for this weekend. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Worldwide Technology Raceway. Now, there's an article that came out from the St. Louis Post Dispatch that Adam Cern put out. And it says that Worldwide Technology really was one of the only new markets that got a NASCAR race in 2022. And the process never saw us continue to grow Worldwide Technology Raceway. Obviously, this weekend is a NASCAR Cup Series race return at Worldwide Technology Race. So the second year of a three year contract that the track currently holds at this particular moment that goes through next year and obviously worldwide technology race they've done a lot of upgrades to the racetrack especially as of recently and overall this track is headed toward a very bright and a really great future i love this facility i was there last year and i know they've done a lot of upgrades to worldwide technology raceway as well so it's really awesome to see the upgrades they have done to the racetrack and i'm really looking forward to see all the stuff they've done in the racetrack. Wish I could be there this year, but nonetheless, really excited to see Worldwide Technology grow. St. Louis fans just need to continue supporting, and I think St. Louis is one of the best cities when it comes to supporting events. So really awesome to see, and glad to see that the event has a lot of support. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Kevin Harvick number 29. Now, the Kevin Harvick number 29 2001 Atlanta car is actually going to pace the field at Atlanta Motor Speedway before the green flag drops. They've done this in the past. I think Richard did that in 2018 or 2019 when he had the number three car pace in the field. For when he drove the number three Dale Earnhardt scheme that won in 2000 at Talladega. So this is really, really awesome that they're going to be doing this. Obviously, of course, this is Kevin Harvick's final NASCAR Cup Series season. He'll retire at the end of 2023. So I think it's really cool that they're doing this overall. And I love that they're going to have Kevin Harvick's number 29 car pace in the field at Atlanta. I think it's really awesome, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the SRX. As it was announced on Wednesday afternoon that the Safford race for the SRX has sold out for this 2023. It is now the second race that has already sold out for 2023, which I think the SRX starts in a couple weekends from now. I think about a month from now, the season is going to start. The SRX this year has a lot of hype. Obviously, of course, they will be joining ESPN in 2023 for the third year, and they've got a much stronger lineup in 2023 as well. You have Tony Stewart, Brad Keselowski, 
Haley Deegan, Ryan Newman back this year, Joseph Newgarden. You've got other drivers like Julio Cascinevis come back for a few races. Kyle Busch is going to be in for a few races. Denny Hamlin, Kevin Harvick, Daniel Suarez, Clint Boyer. A lot of big names are going to be part of the Astrox in 2023. And just to see that Stafford once again has sold out is absolutely incredible. And I really hope that the Astrox can succeed this year. They've got a really good broadcast lineup. And I think it's honestly going to be really exciting to see the Astrox back in 2023. A lot of people are excited about it. And I'm also excited about it as well. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Mason Maggio. As it was announced yesterday that Mason Maggio will drive the 66 for NBM Motorsports this weekend at Portland. I believe this will be Mason Maggio's second or third career NASCAR Xfinity Series start that he's been able to have an attempt. I believe he already tried to make his NASCAR Xfinity Series debut earlier, sir, if I remember correctly. I believe he failed to qualify. This is going to be a really good opportunity for Mason. Obviously, there's a lot of competitive cars. I do believe that everyone is going to make show this week in Xfinity, so he'll be able to have an opportunity, I think, to run really, really well. Mason also does have a lot of road course experience, which I think is going to help him overall. So really excited to see Happy's getting the opportunity and looking forward to see that he will get the opportunity to drive for NBM Motorsports this weekend at Portland. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about McLaren Grills. As it was announced yesterday evening, the McLaren Grills is going to sponsor Kyle Busch next weekend at Sonoma. This will be the second of multiple races that they're going to sponsor Kyle Busch this season. I believe the McLaren Girls will sponsor Kyle Busch for three or four races in the 2023 season. Now, the last time McLaren Girls was on Kyle Busch's car, which of course was Talladega, that is when Kyle Busch won his second race at Talladega ever in the Cup Series and also second race of the 2023 season. Kyle Busch, I think, is going to be a favorite at that race. We've seen how fast the A car was, especially at road courses. You go back to Circuit and Bear because how strong Kyle Busch was. Maybe, just maybe, the McLaren girls' luck could come into play and help Kyle Busch next week at Sonoma. I think Kyle Busch is going to be a favorite to win, and I think he's got a really good shot and opportunity to win that race at Sonoma. I think he will be a threat to get the victory there. Really cool to see they're stepping up to the plate. They are very supportive and really happy to see that they're getting the opportunity to work with Kyle Busch once again. I think it's really exciting stuff, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Eric Amarola. As it was announced on Wednesday morning, the Eric Amarola will drive the 28th for RSS Racing next weekend at Sonoma Raceway. Now, Eric Amarola will be among multiple NASCAR Cup Series drivers who will be racing in the event as he looks to get better on road courses. Now, we'll be talking about Eric Amarola near the end of this episode, but Eric Amarola is historically not really a good road course racer, so I think that's one of the major reasons why he is coming down to the Xfinity Series to get some more road course experience. I think he did already attempt to make a start this year in 2023 at Circuit of the Americas, but I think it's a really good idea for him to come down and try to get some more experience so he can be better at road courses. Nonetheless, this is a good opportunity for him, but it's not a fast car. Obviously, RSS Racing shows a decent pace of Ryan C this season, but they haven't had a lot of great performances with that 28 car this year. So hopefully, he can do a really good job and prove me wrong and can run up front in that car this next weekend at Sonoma. Hopefully, he can do a really good job in that car. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Monaco Grand Prix TV ratings. As it was reported by Adam Stern on Wednesday evening that the Monaco Grand Prix, ABC earned a 0.89 rating and 1.79 million viewers. That is up from a 0.76 rating and 1.396 million viewers in 2022. Now, obviously, that is a huge increase, one of the most watched events for Formula One. That is an absolutely big dub for Formula One. A lot of people tuned in. Obviously, the race was a little more exciting than I think a lot of us expected to be, especially when the rain came into play. I feel like the race did end up, end up being a lot more exciting. So it's really good to see that the Monaco TV ratings have gone up and really excited that a lot of people tuned into that event and really glad to see that a lot of people were watching. Because, again, I thought the race was better than it was last year, and I think it was very intriguing. Very, very exciting, and I think it was a very fun event at the end of the day overall, to be honest with you. Glad to see, though, the TV ratings are up. 
And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Dale Jr. Now, Dale Jr. spoke to the media in the Chicago area, and he spoke on the challenges of the Chicago street course around the track. He was very surprised that there were points where the track was very, very wide, and there were going to potentially be opportunities to pass. But he also said that there are some areas where it's going to be very, very tight, and it's going to be very difficult to pass. Obviously, we're about a month away from the Chicago Street Course race happening. I believe it's 29 or 20, I think it's 28 or 29 days away from currently happening at this moment. NASCAR will be racing in the Chicago area. There's obviously been a lot of negativity and negative press around the Chicago Street Course event. Very recently, there was an article that came out talking about how they're expecting that the aldermen are apparently calling for a meeting with the roads expected to be repaved and a lot of closures happening. They're expected to basically have an alderman who wants to have a meeting grilling NASCAR, which, let's be honest, the city of Chicago signed that deal, and NASCAR was not the main part of that. Yes, NASCAR wanted to bring a race into the Chicago area, but I do believe that NASCAR is really not 100% at fault for that. Now, I will say that there is a very strong chance that this could be the only race in the Chicago area, especially with all the negative press that this event has gotten. Some cities have been really revolving around supporting their events. Other, some, not so much. St. Louis has been support of Gateway, but you're not seeing a lot of support of the Chicago Street Course event. I'm not surprised. I'm not really shocked by the negative press. There's been a lot of negative press around the event, but I'm not overall shocked about it, to be honest with you. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about the National Fairgrounds. Now, we do have a couple stories revolving around the National Fairgrounds we're going to talk about today. The first one came out on Wednesday afternoon, and it comes out from the president of the soccer stadium in the National Fairgrounds area, that being John Ingram. And John Ingram says it is concerned about financial implications of having two stadiums in the same area. Now, here's the thing for John Ingram that he needs to understand. Some cities have multiple stadiums in their events. Look at Kansas City. Kansas City, they have a soccer stadium right outside the racetrack, and I believe the casino also helps run that event. So I do believe that that is a little bit of BS from John Ingram. Plus, I also believe that Philadelphia, they've got multiple stadiums in the same complex. It is going to help that you have national there because people can park at the basically in the same parking lot as the fairgrounds and they can walk over there. Plus, it makes money for that natural area. And of course, they're not to pay really as much. So I really do not agree with his point because also not to mention the soccer stadium is getting built. Meanwhile, you have the track that's been there since 1904. So it's really frustrating and kind of ridiculous to see that people are trying against it. Obviously, it's just a soccer stadium. They're jealous. And obviously, they're going to get a lot of people that are going to come to that event but also people that want to go to the National Fairgrounds event as well. So overall, I don't 100% agree with his points, and I think it's not really something he should be concerned over, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Thor Sport Racing. Now, Thor Sport Racing was announced yesterday morning that they have announced a lot of crew change changes that are going to be taking place at that team. First, Shane Wilson is no longer going to be crew chiefing for Matt Crafton. It was announced that Jared Prince, who had been the crew chief for Ben Rose, is going to crew chief for Matt Crafton starting this weekend at Worldwide Technology Raceway. What happens for Ben Rose then? Well, Brian Ross, who was the lead engineer at Doors for Racing, is going to be the crew chief for Ben Rose. Now, let's first discuss about this move. Matt Crafton is always going to be the top priority at Doors for Racing. Despite probably being one of the least performing drivers over the last few years at that team, he's going to be the top priority because Matt Crafton has been at Doors for Racing. So they're obviously going to cater a lot more to Matt Crafton. Even his performance hasn't gotten better because how many crew chief changes has Matt Crafton had? He had Jeff Hensley beginning of last year. Then they got other people. They lost Junior Joyner. And they had a lot of crew chief changes at that team. And Matt Crafton's performance still has not gotten better. Meanwhile, while Ben Rose has struggled the last few weeks, he had a good crew chief work with him, that being Jared Prince. I think Brian Rosso, because he was a lead engineer, I think this could help Ben Rose out in a big way. Because, yes, Ben Rose had struggled the last few weeks, but really it had not been his fault. But like I said, they're obviously going to go ahead and cater to Matt Crafton as more than Ben Rose, because, again, Matt Crafton is the main guy at the team. That's just facts. He's the main guy at the team, and they're going to cater to him a lot more. But it's interesting to see that they have gone ahead and, and change up some crew chief changes for that event. I'm not surprised about it. I'm disappointed, but I'm not overall surprised, to be honest with you. 
And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Coca-Cola 600 TV ratings. Now, the Coca-Cola 600 TV ratings came out on Wednesday evening, and they're actually surprisingly pretty good for Monday rates. So according to Adam Cern, Fox TV got 3.399 million viewers for Monday's rescheduled Coca-Cola 600. And according to Eric Adamson, who's one of the higher-ups and executives at Fox, he says that the race actually peaked at 4 million viewers. I think it was down from like 4 million last year, but honestly, for Monday race, that's actually really good. And you remember, they actually started that race at 2, and also there was a rain delay that was part of that. So for the race to nearly have 3.4 million at average viewers that were tuning the event, I honestly think that's actually really, really good. Now, it's expected that this week, of course, coming up worldwide technology because of Chase Elliott's suspension, where we're going to talk about Chase Elliott here in a little bit. But obviously, with Chase Elliott no, not going to be in the car this weekend, ratings are likely going to be down, so we're not going to be surprised with a huge drop in TV ratings, even though it's absolutely the right call to suspend him. That being said, I'm really happy to see the TV ratings are up for the Coca-Cola, not up, but honestly, for a Monday race, this is really, really good in my opinion. I'm glad to see the ratings are not that bad this weekend. I thought they were going to be way worse than they were, so I'm really glad to see that people did tune into the event and very happy nonetheless to see the TV ratings are overall pretty good. They look solid, they look spectacular, and I'm excited to see the ratings do look really, really good in my honest opinion for a Monday race because sometimes it could have been down. It was on Fox and half as many people watch. I think is really awesome and really incredible to be honest with you. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Mike Buggerarix. As it was announced yesterday that Mike Buggerarix will be the crew chief for Chase Briscoe for the next six NASCAR Cup Series races. Now, why is he going to be the crew chief? Well, Mike is a higher up at Stewart's Racing. But remember, Johnny Klossemeyer has been suspended for six races after a major, major penalty, probably the biggest penalty in NASCAR history, if not the biggest, one of the biggest penalties in NASCAR history was dropped for a counterfeit part in one of the ducks in the engine manifold. It, it will be a six-race suspension, $250,000 fine, and a loss of 120 driver and owner's points. Now, obviously, Chase Briscoe dropped from 17th in points down to 31st or 32nd in points. It has not been a good year for Chase Briscoe. That being said, this is a pretty big pickup for Chase Briscoe for the next two weeks because this could be a huge thing that could help Chase Briscoe off. Because let's be honest, Chase Briscoe has not fired off with a lot of good speed, especially as of recently. Look at his performances, and he has not had a lot of fire off speed recently. So maybe Bike can come in here and really help Chase Briscoe out this week, in which I, to be honest, I think he is going to help a lot. I think his performance will absolutely improve. I think he will do better this week. I don't think he's going to win, but I think he certainly could contend a little bit more because, like I said, they've had no pace and no speed really recently. So hopefully they can do a really good job in six weeks, help him out because Mike's been a guy who's won races with Clint Boyer, so he knows how to do it. He knows what he's doing, and overall I think Mike can do a really good job crew chiefing for Chase Briscoe. Hopefully he can continue and do a really, really good job for Chase Briscoe. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about A.J. Allmendinger. As it was announced on Wednesday morning, the A.J. Allmendinger will drive the 10 for Colic Racing next weekend at Sonoma Raceway. Obviously, Jordan Taylor will be driving the 10 car this upcoming weekend at Portland, but A.J. will drive the 10 car at Sonoma. This will be his second Xfinity Series start in 2023 of four or five races that he is going to run. Now, last time A.J. drove the 10 car in Xfinity, Guess what? He ended up winning, albeit in very controversial circumstances when he got into Sheldon Creed, but he still went on to win the race. Now, I think AJ is going to be the favorite in that event. Now, of course, you're going to have a lot of cup guys that are running. We've already talked about Eric Amarola. He'll be running the event. I believe that Kyle Larson is also going to be driving the number 17 Hendrick Motorsports car, and I believe also Ty Gibbs is going to be driving the 19. So he is going to have a lot of competition in that event, and it wouldn't surprise or shock me if there are more cup guys running at Sonoma as well. That being said, this is a well deserved opportunity for AJ. I think he will be very, very competitive, and I think he'll have a very good shot, chance, and a really strong opportunity to get the win. I think he's going to be a favor. I think he's going to be a threat, and nonetheless, I think he does have a really good shot and a really good opportunity to win with Call Racing. I think he will absolutely got a chance to win the event. I think he'll be a favor to get the win overall, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Trevor Bank. 
Now, Trevor Bain most recently spoke to Kelly Grano from Racer.com and spoke to her about some of the struggles of not being able to race. Now, Trevor Bain did confirm her that he will race with Joe Gibbs Racing in maybe a race or two in 2023. But he thought he would be full-time in 2023. He revealed that he did have some huge opportunities and huge potential rides with Joe Gibbs Racing or a Truck Series team to go full-time in 2023. In fact, he thought so much he was going to be racing full-time in NASCAR 2023 that he actually sold his coffee shop that he currently had in Tennessee. However, because the sponsorship that he was supposed to have kind of fell through, he will not get to run full-time this year, and that's why he's been working with TV a lot more. Now, the big question I have is what team was he looking at? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if it was KBM. Kyle Bajor Sports obviously didn't have, have a driver at the time, and obviously it was back in June the last time he raced. He kind of said he was looking to go full-time in 2023, but that did not end up happening, and it really is a shame for Trevor Bain, because I think Trevor Bain is overall a really, really talented driver, and last year really proved himself. He performed really great in the 18 car last year and was competing for wins, and probably should have won a race or two last year with how well he performed. Now, my big question is, is what race is he going to run? Maybe Bristol later this year? Obviously, Bristol is his home racetrack. I would not be surprised. I don't think anybody has been announced for that race yet for that 19 car yet, so I'd imagine he'll drive that 19 car at Bristol. What about Nashville? I don't remember if there's anybody's been, anybody's been announced for Nashville in a couple weeks or not, but that could be a potential possibility for Trevor Bain. But I do believe that he should be full-time. Trevor Bain is an underrated driver. He really did a good job last year in that car. And nonetheless, I do think he deserves to go full-time next season. I really hope some sort of sponsorship. I wouldn't be surprised if it's Dev Devotion Nutrition, that company that was sponsored from a part-time last year. A lot of people kind of talk about how kind of sketchy that company was. They didn't have a lot of followers, I think, on Instagram or other platforms, which I think is a huge factor in why he's not racing full-time. It's a shame because, like I said, Trevor Bain did a fantastic an incredible job last year. I think he deserves to be full-time in NASCAR. I really hope he does get a shot to go full-time again and really hope he gets to run some races. I think if he wins a race, I think most certainly if you're looking at Joe Gibbs race, if they're going to have more issues, because here's the thing, Ryan Trucks wants to go full-time next year, and he's got more sponsored funding than Trevor Bain right now. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. But nonetheless, I think he absolutely deserves a shot to go full-time, and hopefully he does get an opportunity and a shot to go full-time in the near future. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Carson Hosovar. Now, Carson Hosovar was speaking to the media in regards to making his NASCAR Cup Series debut this weekend as he'll drive the number seven for Spire Motorsports, as Corey Joy will drive the number nine for Hedrick Motorsports this weekend with Chase Elliott's suspension. And he spoke on the change of his driving style because a lot of people have called him out in regards to his driving style. And he feels like that he has to earn the respect back that he lost. And he's been trying to earn that back over the last couple months. Now, he also reveals something very interesting that he actually was in the Junior Motorsports shop. Obviously, Spire Motorsports, his Finney Series program, does have an alliance with Junior Motorsports. But he's talking about the potential possibility of driving for Junior Motorsports in 2024. Let's first speak about Carson Osbar's change as a driver. I have noticed it in the last two months, really since that Martinsville race, that Carson Osbar has been maturing as a race car driver. He's been racing a lot more clean, racing a lot more respectfully. Maybe the truck series field hasn't really done that, but we've been seeing Carson Osbar mature a lot more as a race car driver right before our eyes. And honestly, I have been really impressed with Carson Osbar over the last two weeks how much he has improved as a race car driver. And I think he deserves this opportunity and a shot. Again, he, his goal, I think, in his Cup Series debut is to run as many laps as possible. Try to complete all the laps and also don't make any mistakes on the racetrack and make any enemies and make yourself look like a fool. He's young. He's only 20. But you also do have to remember one thing. Carson Osmar, like I said, is only 20 years old. He's got a lot of maturity he can do, and I think he's already trying to show that maturity. And I have a lot of respect for that, and I think he is going to continue doing that. Now, let's talk about the other part of his story, and that's the potential drive for Junior Motorsports. Obviously, Spire Motorsports Xfinity Series program does have an alliance with Junior Motorsports in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And Carson has been driving select starts with this team. He's made two starts with the team so far. And honestly, I've been really impressed with Carson Nosebar driving for Spire, where he's already scored two top 10s in three of the starts he's had. And that other start that he, where he had some mechanical gremlins with Bobby Dodder's uh, SS Greenlight team, he was in the top 10 in that race for top 15 before issues hit, which for that team is really, really good, all things considered. Now, that being said, and going back to this, 
I think Carson Drive Virginia Motorsports is a really high possibility. Now, there's other drivers that could have an opportunity to drive. Obviously, Roger Kruf could drive Virginia Motorsports next, or even Carson Quaffle, who currently drives for their team in the car store at the moment. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in regards to that, but I think Carson does have a shot of going full-time in Xfinity next year. I think he's earned a shot at it, and I think he deserves an opportunity and a chance. So I think he could go next year racing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, but we're going to have to wait and see what happens in regards to that. But I hope he gets an opportunity and a shot to race in the Xfinity Series. Really hope he gets the opportunity. As I'm currently editing today's video, we have some major news that just broke, and it was just announced from Tricon Garage that Corey Heim will not drive the 11 this weekend at Worldwide Technology Raceway due to an illness. Jesse Love will substitute for Corey Heim this weekend in the 11 truck for him, and Tony Breidinger will drive the one for Tricon on Tri Garage this weekend. This definitely major shock and major news. Now, Tricon Garage has also revealed in it that they are going to going to be appealing for a waiver, which I expected they are going to get that medical waiver. This is absolutely shocking news because Corey Heim was a favor going into this weekend. Actually, my pick for this weekend at Worldwide Technology Raceway, but he will not be racing. First thing I want to say is I wish him the best of luck and wish him a speedy recovery. Hoping he can be ready to go. I think the truck series goes off for a few weeks, so maybe it's just like the flu or some sort of, we don't exactly know what it is, but I'm wishing the best of luck and wishing him a speedy recovery as well because I was not expecting this. But this is now the second person that has gotten a waiver this week, as we'll talk about later in the episode. As you watch, Chase Elliott also received a medical waiver, at, well, not a medical, but a playoff waiver as well, which I, like I said, I expect that Tricon is going to get that waiver in there. Now, this is a really good opportunity for Jesse Love. Of course, he was already making his truck series debut. He was supposed to drive the one for Tricon Garage, and now you got Jesse driving the 11 this weekend, which that is a championship caliber truck. We've seen Corey Heim run extremely well, and I think Jesse is an extremely talented driver. Jesse could now be the favorite to win, even though he doesn't have any truck series experience. Jesse could now be the favorite to win. Wouldn't surprise me there. But also going back, Tony Breidinger. I was a little hard on her. Thought she wasn't going to do good. And she did pretty good for a truck series debut. She did, I believe, finish in the top 15, which is pretty impressive for her. So maybe she can do a really good job this weekend once again. Who knows at this point. But really surprising and shocking news. Wishing Corey the best luck. Hope he'll be back in the truck really, really soon. And wishing him a speedy recovery as well. Hopefully he'll be back really, really soon. Hope he can return to the truck really soon. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the National Fairgrounds. Now, it was reported by Adam Stern on Wednesday that legislation to approve a deal to overhaul the National Fairgrounds Speedway was filed with the Metro Council Office Friday. But the bill has a lot of roads to cover and hurdles to clear in a few short months. Obviously, we already have had this approved by the Fair Board, but now has to go through the Metro Council. Now, obviously, the Mayor's Office is really trying to push the Metro Council to get this event approved and the Fair National Fairgrounds to be basically approved. Now, obviously, the National Fairgrounds wants to have NASCAR Cup Series dates once again in Bristol Motor Speedway. They are also involved with trying to get this racetrack back. But there's been a lot of negativity on the other side of stuff when it comes to the Metro Council, where people who are on that Metro Council really don't want this event to go through. And this is the next hurdle for this for this to basically end up getting approved. Now, obviously, the National Fairgrounds, NASCAR has not raced at that track since 2000 when the NASCAR Xfinity Series last raced. And they're hoping in the next few years to get back to that race track. I think that's one of the reasons why I think Bristol doesn't have much longer is because I think eventually National Fairgrounds is going to get on the schedule in the coming years. Now, the big question is going to be, do I think it is going to end up getting approved? I think it is very, very likely that the National Fairgrounds will end up getting approved and NASCAR will actually return to the National Fairgrounds. Here's the thing, though, that could really hold this up, and is there's people on the other side that could really hold this event up overall. Now, I, like I said, I think it will get approved. I don't see NASCAR holding back too much longer, and I think the people have really presented very good points. And plus, they've already talked about adding stuff like mufflers for the event, which is why they've been testing them for other races. They're going to be at the Chicago Street Course event. We've already seen it at the LA Coliseum, though there are some things that they are going to have to work on when it is some when it comes to those mufflers. There are things that they do have to work on to make sure that is working according to plan and is working very, very well. That being said, I think there's a very good chance and a very strong possibility, like I said, it will end up getting approved eventually. The question is, when it does get approved, how long do I think it will take for NASCAR to go back there? Well, my earliest guess, if it does get approved this year, 
will be at earliest, maybe 2025 and at the latest 2026 or 2027. But if it doesn't get approved till late 2023, I would say 2026 at the earliest. It's going to take a few years because a lot of things at that track, they do have to work on to make sure it's up to par and ready to go. But I do believe, like I said, I think it will end eventually get it, end up getting approved, and I think it will end up happening where we'll be racing at the fairgrounds in the not-so-distant future. I think it'll get resolved. I think this issue will be cleared up, and I think it will happen where NASCAR will return to the fairgrounds. Hopefully, NASCAR does decide to go back to the fairgrounds soon. They want to go back, and I think they're trying to bring it because I think this is the perfect market. Plus, for people trying to diss the event that are in the national area, this track has been around since 1904. It's been around for 120 years. So don't you dare diss off this because I want the fairgrounds to come back. Please get this approved so NASCAR can return to the national fairgrounds. All right, now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chase Elliott. Now, it was announced yesterday afternoon, as expected, that Chase Elliott has been officially, for the second time this year, has been granted a playoff waiver. Now, Chase Elliott already had been granted a playoff waiver after his injury from his snowboarding accident in the mountains of Colorado, where he sat out for six weeks. Now, Chase Elliott, not surprising, is getting a playoff waiver. Like I said, this is the second time this year that Chase Elliott has received a playoff waiver. As we all know at this point, that Chase Elliott has his suspended for this weekend's race at Royal Technology Raceway, also known as Gateway, for right rear Denny Hamlin down the straightaway. Now, there are a lot of questions. A lot of people think that Chase Lee may have, should have not gotten approved, maybe a waiver. And while maybe it's a little bit controversial, Chase Lee did end up getting a waiver. We've already seen other drivers that have gotten suspended in the past get playoff waivers. Josh Looms is a perfect example. He got a playoff waiver after he was suspended for one race at after the Atlanta incident. And when he was suspended at Coda, he ended up getting a playoff waiver later that season when he came back at Richmond Raceway. And then he had other drivers like Johnny Sauter, who when he was suspended for one race in 2019, that he would end up getting a playoff waiver as well. Now, we obviously talk about Chase Lee being suspended. I've seen a lot of conversation from people who are still trying to say that Chase Lee should not have gotten suspended for right rear Denny Hamill down the straightaway. When it's clear as day that he should have gotten a one-race suspension because NASCAR set a president last year after Bubba Walls right reared Kyle Larson down the straightaway in 2022 at Las Vegas. It's not for the shoving into the car. It's not for shoving the official. It's for right rearing him down the straightaway. It was unacceptable and uncalled for. And Chase Lee, I think, is going to learn a lot from this. He's a driver who's young. I, again, it's still uncalled for and inexcusable. And we need to stop seeing that kind of stuff happening. And I think that a lot of talk is really, should we get rid of playoff waivers? And I think that's a huge good question to ask. Maybe NASCAR makes a change after the season where they don't give playoff waivers out for suspension. Because I feel like NASCAR hands playoff waivers out like it's candy. And maybe NASCAR just does away with playoff waivers altogether or just for extreme circumstances. I think there are circumstances where you can give a playoff waiver out. But it seems like NASCAR nowadays, they give playoff waivers out for pretty much everything at this particular point. I think a lot of fans do get frustrated when they do hand playoff waivers out on a consistent basis. It's like a week-by-week -week process. They hand out playoff waivers or turn out some sort of suspensions or some issues or have some sort of penalties. It really doesn't matter at this point. But I'm not surprised. I expected the Chase to get a playoff waiver. I, I do agree with a lot of people. Maybe we should do away with playoff waivers going into next season or get rid of it for suspensions. But I do agree maybe some change needs to be made. But I'm not surprised that Chase Lee did end up <clears throat> receiving a playoff waiver. Not shocked by that at all. And now we're going to jump on to the only major story we got in today's episode, but it's a big one. And we're talking about NASCAR silly season. Now, Jordan Bianchi put out an article on The Athletic, and he talked about a lot of things revolving around silly season and a lot of questions still revolving around silly season. Now, we've already had a lot of major signings that have happened for silly season. Obviously, Daniel Suarez, Ross Chastain, and Alex Bowman, and Chase Briscoe have all signed multi-year contract extensions with their organizations, and other teams are working on their extensions as well. But he put out a really awesome article in regards to that you should check out. But I'm going to go through all the points there. First, let's talk about Stuart Haas Racing. So, currently, it's expected at the end of the season that Eric Amarola is going to retire from NASCAR Cup Series competition. Now, Eric Amarola was actually supposed to retire at the end of 2022, but Smithfield convinced him to return for one more season. His family also convinced him to return for one more season in 2023. We're in the beginning of June, and Eric Amarola was asked on May 20th, which is about a week and a half ago, or almost two weeks ago, was he going to return in 2024? And Eric Amarola says he is unsure. 
sure. But according to sources, it is expected Eric Armbrough is going to retire. Now, I'm not really surprised by that. Eric Armbrough, I kind of feel like, was going to retire at the end of the season. So I'm not entirely shocked by that. The big question is going to be who is going to replace him. Well, there are two favorites currently at the moment who could take over that 10 card 2023. The two favorites are Zane Smith and Michael McDowell. Now, both drivers are currently under contract with Front Row Motorsports. Now, according to Jordan Bianchi, it really depends on what Front Row decides to do. If Zane Smith does stay with Front Row Motorsports, Michael McDowell could end up driving the 10 car in 2024. Now, Michael McDowell, a lot of people feel like if you gave him a top tier opportunity or a top tier ride, that he could be a really good driver at that team and do a really good job in fourth grade because we haven't seen Michael McDowell have a top tier opportunity in a very, very long time. So he could do a really good job there. But if Zane Smith's let go because Ford may take him, he would be the driver in the 10 car. Now, personally, I'd like to see Zane Smith take that 10 car next year because I think Zane Smith would be a really big pickup for SHR. But I think Front is also a better team right now than Stuart Haas Racing. Their performance has been better. So that's a big question around the 10 car is who's going to take that. I think Zane Smith will likely take that 10 car, but we'll have to wait and see. There's another note when it comes to front row quarter, Jordan Bianchi, is that Todd Gillen right now has not worked on a contract for 2024. A lot of that right now, I believe, is due to sponsorship and funding. And that's what I think is holding back Todd Gillen from signing a multi-year agreement and a multi-year deal with the team. I would imagine that Todd will return to front row in 2024 because I think they made a mistake by getting rid of him, but we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> And now we transition over to Joe Gibbs Racing, as there's some details that need to be announced there. First, Martin Trex Jr. is expected to return in 2024. Now, he told the media a couple weeks ago after winning at Dover, he said that he will likely have a decision for them by the end of June. So in the coming weeks, we likely know about Martin Trex Jr.'s future. It's expected that Martin Trex Jr., how good he's been performing in 2023, that he's likely going to return in 2024. Which I think a few months ago, if you asked him, he probably was going to retire. But after how good he's been performing, I think he's going to come back in 2024. But if Mark Trix and your Denny Hamill are to leave Joe Gibbs Racing at the end of the season, which I think both are going to return to respective teams, then John Ringmachek is the top candidate to potentially place one of those drivers. Now let's go back and talk about Denny Hamill. Denny Hamlin is likely to sign a multi-year extension with Joe Gibbs Racing, but it could also be a one-year extension or maybe a multi-year deal with the team. A lot of that hinges on FedEx and 2311 Racing. If Denny Hamlin signs a multi-year deal and 2311 signs their deals, Denny Hamlin will return to JGR. But John Hunter would be a really good candidate to replace both of them if it does end up happening. Now let's talk about Corey LaJoy. Now Corey LaJoy is going to have a really huge opportunity this weekend because he'll be driving the 9 for Hendrick Motorsports as, like I said, Chase Lee has been suspended for a race. Corey LaJoy could sign a one-year extension with Spire heading into 2024. However, Corey LaJoy could also join a couple other teams, that being the Wood Brothers or Trackhouse Racing. Now, Wood Brothers are currently 50-50 with Harrison Byrne, if they're going to keep around or not. Harrison needs to step up his game and his performance if he is going to stay with the team in 2024. Now, Corey LaJoy also talked about Trackhouse. According to Jordan Bianchi, it is stated that Trackhouse was actually talking about maybe expanding to a third car for maybe 2024, but that might be shoved. But if Trackhouse is to expand their program, maybe in 2024, Corey LaJoy could end up going there. But if Corey does really well, I think Trackhouse might have to consider expanding their team because they have Ross Chastain and Daniel Suarez were two journeyman drivers at the time, and Corey could get a really good opportunity at Trackhouse, and I think it formed really good at that team. Now let's go back to talk about Harrison Burn. Like I said a second ago, Harrison Burn is currently 50-50 with Wood Brothers. I think he needs to perform. He needs to set up his performance in game if he's going to return. He's got that Dex Imaging sponsorship, which I think could help him. There are rumors, rumors that he could go maybe to SHR in 2024, but it sounds like that's not the case at the moment. It sounds like that's kind of off the table. And the final thing noted in the article revolves around Justin Haley. Now, Justin Haley is expected to return to call racing in 2024. However, there are some things that could hurt that, but it's likely he's coming back to that team in 2024. Now let's transition to talk about SHR because they've got a lot of things we know. Obviously, Josh Berry is going to be driving for Stewart House Racing, and that is expected to be announced. He'll be taking over for Kevin Harvick, and Rodney Childers will be the crew chief. 
But going back to the 10 team, I expect that Zane Smith will be driving that 10 car next year. I know Michael Badal could be a candidate for that as well, which Michael Badal getting a top tier ride will be really, really cool. But also, I think he's done a really good job at front row, so I think they could keep him around going into next year. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the silly season, not just in the Cup Series side of things, but the Xfinity Series side of things as well. And we also could see other teams jump up the Cup, like a Junior Motorsports could go Cup racing potentially next year. We've already heard about that. They, they when considering it. They want to go Cup racing. And we also have about track house expansion. Track house expansion would be really, really cool. They technically do have a third car with the Project 91 car. Maybe they bring a third car in like the number 97. Who knows at this point, but it's going to be very interesting to have, see what happens in regards to the silly season. So, that is going to be today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe to the channel, notifications on so if when a video does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as part of my Patreon as well. Link description below with that and comment your thoughts below on today's video. Do you think Zane Smith will drive a 10 car or not? Or do you think Eric Almer will retire at the end of the season? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Tomorrow on the channel, there is going to be two videos on the channel. Of course, we're going to have the NASCAR Xfinity Series and Truck Series race reviews. Then on Sunday, we have the NASCAR Cup Series race review from Gateway, the Worldwide Technology Race. And we got a lot of content dropping on the channel as well. The next likely project coming out is a Top 100 Greatest NASCAR Drivers of All Time. That is coming out on June 13th. Make sure to tune in that. And I could have an update video for this channel coming out really, really soon that you might want to tune into. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.